So I grew up uh, just outside of Dayton, Ohio, which isn't a huge city, but it's definitely not the country. And I had a, a very a unique experience when I went to college. I spent a couple years in a very rural part of Western Kentucky, and I had this crazy experience. I, I'd been there a few weeks. I was trying to find like a church to attend and serve in every week, and um, found one, and ended up connecting with a family there that that kind of took me in, and you know they were gracious to me as a lonely college student in the middle of nowhere, and. Remember one one afternoon, one evening, I was over at their house, and uh, you know they're grilling out. There's some people over, whatever, and and I remember as it got dark, I looked up into the sky and I saw something I'd never seen before in all of my life: stars. Now I had seen stars before, but not like this. It was a deep dark. You know, the sky was just a deep dark, and I've really seen a deep dark like that in the sky before, having grown up in the city and, and, and the stars were so bright and there were so many of them. And I don't know what happened. I just kind of lost my mind there for a minute. And I'm like, oh my goodness, look at these stars, you know? And everybody around me that grew up there and didn't grow up in the city were just laughing hysterically and it became a moment. And they're making fun of me, and like it's a conversation piece for like years after that. Oh, yeah, 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 I heard about you. You're the guy that never seen the stars before, kind of thing. And I'm like, well, I'd seen the stars, but I never like seen the stars. And like to this day, that family still laughs about this kid who came to college and saw the stars for the very first time. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that. I've had that experience a few times since. You know, when you travel and you're at a place that's more remote and you look up and you can like see some stars or see a brightness that you've never seen before and it really is beautiful and exhilarating. If you grew up in this city like I did, it's definitely uh, a cool experience. And, 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 and the reality is, right, this is true, like, like the deeper the dark, the brighter the light. And, and, and today as we're, as we're working through the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, we're, we're, we're gonna talk about what it looks like to shine in a dark world in such a way that God is glorified in your life. And, and it's a really cool thing today. Paul's actually gonna reference the stars. We're gonna see here in a moment a reference to the stars. And here's what Paul says should be true of every one of us who live for King Jesus. He, he, he says these simple words, that we should shine like the stars. And I think he's talking about stars in a rural context. <laughs> I don't think he's talking about city stars. Are you with me? Because the Philippian believers living in Philippi, they were, of course, uh, a part of the Roman Empire. They were a Roman city and you could get Roman citizenship there. And as a result, there was some shady things that happened in that city. And you've got these new believers now, they're first generation Christians and they're trying to figure out how to live out their faith in this society that in many respects is very dark. Paul says, you gotta shine. The deeper the darkness, the brighter the light. I think of our society today, things are trending worse, not better. It seems to many of us that things are darker, not brighter. And really, even in an election year, not knowing what the result will be in November, it really doesn't matter. I, I, I don't see a change to the overall trend line that things seem to be getting worse, not better in many respects. And I think if Paul were writing to us today, I think he would say this, hey, in your society where things seem to be trending worse, not better, shine like stars. It's an opportunity for you to live out your faith in such a way that you can make a difference. And the deeper the darkness, the brighter the light. Paul's gonna help us here, I think, very practically, live out our faith in such a way that we're, we're country stars, not city stars. <laughs> you know, we, man, we can really shine. I, th I, think, I think there's an opportunity for us to really make a difference. And, and, and if you're new to Christianity, you're new to the church, today I just want you to see some very practical ways that the will of God positively impacts your life. Here at Bell Shoals, we believe 
that the will of God is what's best for us. And that's gonna be Paul's focus today, all right? Now, before we get to the starts, let, let me take you to chapter two. That's where we left off last week, beginning in verse 12. And I, I wanna show you one command. This is kind of gonna set the stage for what follows relative to the stars. Like, he gives us something that's often misunderstood but incredi incredibly profound. Here's what he says in verse 12. He says, therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence. Here's the command, here's the imperative, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. God has a good purpose for your life. Do you believe that? God has a good purpose for your life. God has a good purpose for your marriage. God has a good purpose for your children. God has a good purpose for your career. God has a good purpose for your life. And here's what Paul says. Okay, this is where we're going. If you wanna shine like stars in a darkened world, okay, then, then, then it starts with this command. Then you gotta work out your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that God's will for your life is good. Knowing that God's will for your marriage is good, for your family is good, for your career is good, right? Like, so, so, so you gotta work out what God has worked in. Now, this is very important if you're new to the Bible. Paul is not saying that we save ourselves. Paul does not say that we're to work in God's salvation. Do you know, wanna, you know wanna why he does not say that? It's very simple. We can't work in God's salvation. Only God can do that. Only God can save us. Through the ministry of Jesus, his death, burial, resurrection, turning from our sin, embracing his salvation, you put your faith in Jesus, you ask for his forgiveness, you commit to live for him, and you will become a child of God. Boom, just like that. Born again is how Jesus talked about it, okay? Now, once that happens, God fills you with his Holy Spirit, and then he begins to work in your life to bring to fruition the good purpose that he has for you. But, listen to me very, very carefully now, this is not an excuse for laziness. This does not mean you just kick your feet back in the lazy boy of your Christianity and do nothing. Now you don't work in your salvation, only God can do that, but Paul does say you gotta work it out. If you're taking notes, write this down. This is very, very important. Here's what the word means. It's one word in the original language. It takes a couple of words in English to translate it. Working out your salvation, it's all one word. Here's what that word means. Are you ready for this? This is really important. Continuous, sustained effort. Doesn't mean you save yourself. Here's what Paul's saying. Continuous, sustained effort. You wanna experience God's good purpose in your life? Here's what you gotta do. You've gotta to yield to the Holy Spirit's work in your life. You've gotta fight sin. You gotta prioritize good, godly things. You've, you've gotta make effort. You have to sustain that effort throughout the course of your life. That doesn't save you, but listen to me very, very carefully. That is your part to play in the sanctifying of you. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about sanctification. We're talking about growing in our faith, becoming more like Jesus, leaning into the good purpose of God for our lives, for our marriages, our families, our careers, our influence, right? So, so, so listen to me very, very carefully. It's continuous, sustained effort. And so here's what that looks like. It means that you and I, okay, if we're serious about experience God's best for us, you know what that means? We have to fight sin. Are you doing all that you can do to be pure in your life and in your marriage. Are you doing all that you can do? Because if you're just kicking up your feet, coming to church once a week, kind of lazy boy in it, you know, well, God's gonna do God's thing. Well, you misunderstand the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's not to do everything for you. It's to empower you both through his initiative, his enabling, but also your effort and cooperation to produce what's best in your life. Paul says elsewhere, should we continue in sin that grace may abound, may it never be. 
Our salvation is not an excuse for laziness. Paul says elsewhere in numerous places, actually, that we have to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Active verb. We have to be active in putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Like, we all have things in our lives that threaten us, that threaten our marriages, that threaten our testimonies, that threaten our stewardship. Here's here's the question. Are we engaging in a continuous, sustained effort to put to death in our lives the things that seek to rob us of God's best. And some of you are like, hey, pastor, I'm at a place in my life, you know what, I've been doing this a long time, I think I'm pretty good. Well, (laughs) I think you're pretty stupid. (laughs) Because you will never reach a point in your life where it's like, okay, I have arrived. Paul doesn't give us a footnote here saying, you know, but when you reach a certain age, you're good. As long as there is breath in your lungs and as long as the Lord is leaving you here on this earth, he has a good plan and purpose for your life. And you have to work out what God has worked in and you're gonna have to fight sin. You're gonna have to fight temptation. You're gonna have to lean in to generosity. You're gonna have to lean in to serving. You're gonna have to lean in to engaging others with the gospel. You're gonna have to work out what God has worked in. Paul says to the Philippians, don't think that in your service of King Jesus, it's just I kick back, let God do what God does. No, no, God has done what God does in saving you, filling with the spirit, empowering you, gifting you, now you've got to join him in that effort through his enabling and through his empowering to make the most of his good purpose in your life. And so we got to work out what God has worked in. It reminds me, if you look at American history, of the California gold rush. If you know anything about it, basically, let me just summarize this. Here's what happened, right? Like back in the 1800s, there was gold kind of everywhere, like in rivers, on the ground, and there was this mad rush for people to make their fortunes in in accumulating a lot of easy gold, okay? And there was a lot of it early, but here's what happened. Soon after the gold rush started, you know, all the gold on the surface was gone. All the easy money was gone. From that point forward, there was only gold in the mines. And so there was a common expression that, reverberated throughout those who were sticking with that process, they simply said this, if you want gold, right, you have to mine it out. All the easy gold is gone. You're not gonna find it on a hilltop anymore, right? <laughs> like, you have to mine it out. And here's what Paul's saying, okay, if, you, if you're confused about what does it mean for me to work out my salvation, here's what he's saying. God has given you, through his wonderful work of salvation and through the empowering of us, Holy Spirit, le- lean in here, he has given you all the gold you need, you gotta mine it out. You have everything you need for life and godliness to experience his good purpose for you, but you gotta mine it out. You work out what he's worked in, and then Paul is gonna give us a specific here of how we do that, and therefore how we shine like lights in a darkened world And I know what you're thinking. Okay, if I'm gonna work out my salvation with fear and trembling and I'm gonna participate with God and his good purpose in my life, I want that. I hope that you do in your marriage and family. I hope you're you're encouraged to work out, to be serious about your faith, to be serious about fighting sin, to be serious about engaging in the good plan and purpose of God, engaging in generosity, engaging in service, engaging in mission, right? Okay, I hope you're serious about that. And maybe you're thinking, okay, but I'll boy. Because Paul's gonna mention a specific here of how we do it. I bet you're thinking, man, he's gonna say, okay, if you wanna work out your salvation with fear and trembling, you better not murder anybody. Well, that's true, (laughs) but that's not what Paul says. I bet you're thinking, oh man, if you wanna work out what God's worked in, you can't can't engage in tax evasion. Just a little FYI this time of year. I don't know why I mentioned that, but just (laughs) he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay. I bet Paul's gonna say something about adultery. I bet he's gonna say something about anger. I bet he's gonna say something about mur- I bet he's gonna say something, okay, because he's gonna give us one thing. Are you ready for this? He's gonna give us one way to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I bet you're like, man, this is gonna be a big, big thing. Well, actually it is. You, let me show it to you. Verse 14, do everything without grumbling and arguing. Uh-huh, see, all y'all under conviction right now. That's what it is. That's <laughs> the quietness of the room is conviction. I know that to be true, right? Because 
you're thinking, oh man, he's going to lay something big on us. And he did. <laughs> he did, actually. Now, we don't think of it that way because we live in a culture of such complaining that it's just commonplace. But I just want you to, I want you to feel the weight of this. Paul's like, you got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? Just lean into God's good purpose for your life. You work out what God has worked in, and here's what it looks like. You do everything without grumbling, complaining, same word, or arguing. <laughs> and some of us are like, that's it? Yeah. That's a pretty big deal. Let me, let me show you what he goes on to say here in verse 15. So that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, you ready for this, among whom you shine like stars in the world. Country stars, not city stars. By holding, he continues, firm to the word of life. And then he says, I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering, right? Even if I give up my life for, for Christ on the sacrificial service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul's like, man, I'm fully invested in this. And you guys are like the fruit of my ministry. I love you. You know, we've seen that throughout this letter, this, the, the close relationship Paul has with these believers. And so he says this, you gotta work out what God has worked in by living your life free of grumbling and complaining. Man, that's, that's not what we would expect. But it's a really big deal. So I wanna flush this out today because I think it's a, it's a needed word for all of us. And, and I just want to say as a caveat here, okay, especially if you're new to the Bible, I just want to be crystal clear here. Let me give you a little caveat here. Okay, we, we need to note that there is a difference between a concern and a complaint. Paul's not saying don't ever be concerned. He's not saying don't ever um, take appropriate steps to resolve conflict. He's not saying don't ever have hard conversations. He's not saying don't hold each other accountable. He's not saying um, don't. Uh, pursue unity through resolution. No, no, he's not saying that there's a difference between a concern and a complaint. And clearly, Jesus outlined a process where we can address concern. Here's the difference between a concern and a complaint, okay? A concern, write this down, is always focused on a solution while a complaint is always focused on yourself. That's the difference. Let me say it this way. A concern is unifying, a complaint is divisive. That's the difference, right? If you wanna ask yourself, how do I know if I have a legitimate concern or I'm just engaging in arguing, complaining, and grumbling, just ask yourself this question. Are you really serious about resolution? Are you really serious about moving toward what's best? Do you trust God in this situation even if there aren't steps you can take to resolve the issue? And so here, here's what you're gonna find in your own heart. Here's what I found in my heart, right? Because we all have the same human hearts here. We're all, you know, in need of the grace of God. So here's the difference. If you have a, a, what, what I would classify as a legitimate concern, right, there's gonna be a desire for resolution. There's gonna be a focus on unity. There's gonna be a focus on moving toward what's best. There's gonna be a dependence upon the Lord. There's gonna be an asking for his help in that. Nothing wrong with having legitimate concerns. We're moving toward unity. We're moving toward resolution. We're moving toward what's best. We're doing everything we can. Easy, hard conversations to make that happen. A complaint at its root is self-centered. A complaint is divisive. A complaint is, I'm not necessarily even concerned about resolution, I just want to be angry, and I'm going to spread slander, and I'm going to undermine the person I'm upset with, or I'm going to talk publicly about the situation that I'm unhappy with. A complaint at its root is selfish and divisive. A concern, right, is unifying and solution-oriented. Paul's not saying don't ever have a concern. Here's what he's saying. You wanna work out what God has worked in. Here's one thing you better work on. Cultivating in your life an absence of complaining and grumbling because if you wanna shine like a country star, then you're gonna to have to learn to navigate the darkness around you without complaining and grumbling and arguing. Because your world and the people in it are going to give you plenty of things 
to grumble about. Listen, I thought about just bringing some things to you today that I want to complain about in our world that I dislike, but it's, it would fill the whole time, including rain on Sunday mornings. I have a huge problem with that. <laughs> Very bad for my line of work, okay? How ironic that I'm preaching on complaining and it's pouring outside. I already took it up with the Lord. <laughs> okay. Here's what Paul's saying. I know your society is messed up. I know your world is dark. I know the people around you are hostile. I know things aren't trending in the right direction. You got two choices if you wanna work out what God has worked in. You can either lean into your complaining, lean into your grumbling, be miserable about everything, complain about everything, complain about everybody, or you can work out what God has worked in in this way. You can conduct yourself, right? Here's what he's talking about, with integrity as blameless, pure, innocent children of God and therefore shun as being someone very, very different in this darkened world. And how can we be different, Paul? One thing, here's one thing, not the only thing, here's a big thing. Don't be a negative Nelly. Don't be a Karen. Unless your name is Karen, and then be a good Karen. All right? Right? Don't be that guy who's like, like, think about this. I know many of you expected to hear him say, don't murder Don't commit adultery, right? It's big. He says, don't complain, don't grumble, don't argue. And if if you conduct yourself with that kind of innocence, purity, holiness, positivity, confidence, you will shine like country stars in a very darkened world. Because if you haven't noticed, our world is full of a bunch of complainers. And the problem with that, if you're a Christ follower, is this. Let me show you my key takeaway for today, okay? Complaining is the language of unbelief. You need to write that down. That's why this is such a big deal. Complaining is the language of unbelief. And when you join in to all of the complaining and the grumbling and the division, remember, that's kind of what we're talking about here. You just came off a section last week. We talked about the importance of unity so, I mean, if you're going to be a complainer and a grumbler and you're argumentative and negative and divisive, like Paul's like, you're not shining like stars because that's how the rest of the world operates. You know, it's easier day to be a complainer than at any point in human history. You can tweet, post, text, email, start a Facebook group. <laughs> There are more complainers with more platforms today than at any point in human history. And most of these complainers have no idea what they're talking about. I do this when I watch football, <laughs> right? I just, and I don't mean to brag here. This isn't a sermon on pride, so I can do this, but I don't mean to brag, okay? But I am the greatest football coach in NFL history. I know exactly what to do, what plays to call, what defensive schemes to enact. Now, have I ever played football? No. Have I ever coached football? No. But I've watched football. Let me tell you something. I know what I'm talking about. And I am the greatest coach in NFL history. And um, it's one thing we're just, you know, having fun complaining about our favorite team. But it's another thing. This is what we see in the world today. Like people go to social media. They go online. They post. They text. They email. It's just, man, it's all around us. And Paul says, you want to stand out like lights in a darkened world? Here's one way you do it. Don't be like everybody else. Because positivity is attractive. No one in the history of mankind has ever said, you know what I love about this person? Their negativity. (laughs) I can't get enough of that. Man, I'm around them. They're complaining about everything. They just got issues. Man, it is just, I love that. (laughs) You ever think about this? Positivity is attractive. So Paul says, you want to shine like country stars? Don't be a grumbler. Don't be a complainer. Now, how does that impact your faith? Because complaining is the language of unbelief. It's selfish at its root. It assumes that you're in control of your life. 
It's the language of unbelief. Not only is it the language of unbelief, it's dangerous because for many people it becomes the soundtrack of their lives. In other words, you may not have known this, this is true, complaining is an addictive behavior. There's a book I recommend. It's not, a, it's not written by a Christian author, but it's a fantastic book on human behavior written by Travis Bradbury. It's called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. I love the book. Here, here's one of the things he says. He says, chronic complaining rewires the brain to compound a pattern of complaining. This is the reason, listen to me, there are old curmudgeons in the world today. Newsflash, they didn't start out as old curmudgeons. They started out as young complainers. And they didn't work out their salvation with fear and trembling in this way. They leaned into a spirit of complaining, a spirit of negativity, and over the course of time, here's what happens. Biologically, your brain gets rewired to where your initial thought and approach to new situations in life is always from a negative disposition. That's a learned behavior. That's not a default behavior. Here's how it goes. You, 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 you approach a new situation from a negative disposition. Well, yeah, you know what? I'll go with you, but I'm not gonna like it. Some of you are like, I said that about going to church today. <laughs> I get it. You're probably not the only one, right? Like, all right, I'll try it. I already know I'm not gonna like it. Like, like this becomes the soundtrack of some people's life. And Travis Bradbury talks about it in this great book on human behavior. Like this is an addictive behavior. Like the more you lean into it, the more it defines your perspectives. And here Paul says, 2,000 years ago, long before behavioral studies on the impact of, of thoughts and patterns in the brain, hey, you wanna work out what God has worked in and lean into his good purpose for your life? Don't be negative. Don't be a complainer. Don't be argumentative. Don't be divisive and you will shine like stars in a darkened world because the darkened world is full of people just like that. Isn't this amazing how the Holy Spirit works to give us wisdom? Paul's touching on something that's true of our day to day that was true of his day, but yet he didn't have all the studies that we have to verify it. But yet the Lord knew 2,000 years ago, this is gonna be a problem even for Christ followers that we lead into this negativity to the extent that, that, that we're complaining and grumbling about everything and we sound and look like the rest of the world. Paul says, no, you wanna shine like lights. Be a positive person. Because as a Christ follower, this is what he's talked about, right? You have a lot to be positive about because this world is not your home. This world does not house your citizenship anymore. You're just on a passport. And so you have some reason to be positive when everybody else is negative. Now, Paul helps us here to lean into that with a couple of different specific takeaways. And so let me give you two. If you're taking notes, listen, I'm going to give you two dangers and an anecdote, all right? <laughs> two dangers and an anecdote because this is a helpful word for all of us. Okay, first of all, I want you to see that complaining distorts our perspective. Okay, I just talked about that with emotional intelligence, right? It's habitual. Once you lean into it and you keep leaning into it, it will become habitual. It will become the soundtrack of your life. Paul talks about that, right? He's talking about, right, do everything, not some things, everything without grumbling and arguing, that you may be blameless and pure. Okay, so the reason it's so important because it, it distorts our perspective. We see this going all the way back to the nation of Israel. Let me show you quickly here, especially if you're new to the Bible. This is super wild, right? The children of Israel delivered out of slavery, right? Difficult, abusive slavery. And um, they get out into the wilderness because of their own disobedience, right? They're struggling. But of course, it's never their own fault. It's someone else's fault. And they grumble and they complain ultimately against the Lord. So what, uh, let me show you how, how ridiculous this, this gets. Exodus 14, 11, they say to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why have you make us, made us to leave Egypt? Now watch this. Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? Um, I don't remember that, do you? In Egypt they were saying, why don't you deliver us? What's taking you so long? What's wrong with you? 
Now they get in the wilderness and things get a little hard because of their own stupidity, by the way. And they're like, oh, we tried to tell you, Moses, we were way better off in Egypt. Don't you remember all those times we told you? Man, leave us alone. We want to stay here. You know what complaining does? It changes your perspective. You say, ah, they're making that up. No, 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 no. Here's the problem with chronic complaining. You begin to believe the lie. Let me show you another example, Exodus 16, revisionist history. There, too, the scripture says, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. Here's what they said. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, there, watch this, there we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Uh, I don't remember that either. (laughs) They're like, depending on your age, We had Ryan's Steakhouse every day, or Sizzler's every day, or Golden Corral. Okay, I'm trying to, every generation, I'm trying to hit every generation. All right. Man, we had it made, baby. Oh, man, Moses and Aaron, y'all are so dumb. What what are you doing leading us out of Egypt? Man, we sat around pots. We were eating till we were stuffed. We had leftovers. We had the Alfredo dipping sauce from Olive Garden with our bread. Man, it was so good. We tried to tell you not to take us out of that slavery. And you and I look back on that and we're like, those people lost their minds. And Paul says elsewhere, I don't have this on the screens, but this, you know what, Paul, Paul said those things happened as examples for us who, by the way, struggle with the exact same issues. Because complaining is the language of unbelief. And we do the exact same thing in the exact same way. We have revisionist history. Here's how it works for us. We say things like, <clears throat> now you know, coach, I'm gonna talk to you about my, my, my kid and their playing time. I mean, the way you're coaching just ain't getting done. And here's what we say. I've said this. I just, I, I just want you to know I've said this. And you know what? And I'm not the only parent that feels this way. And those of you who are leaders, you know what that means, right? That person's talking about their spouse and their parent. Sometimes we say that and we're talking about our imaginary friends. Right? Don't we say that? Come on, who said that? Bunch of liars in here. Man, no wonder it's raining today. All right, the judgment of God on you all, you're lying. Bunch of liars up in here, right? Come on, I hear it. Pastor, now I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not the only person that feels this way. Nope, you, your spouse, and your dog, that's who you're talking about, right? You know? And we always write, like, this is how we, I do it all the time. Like, that's my default too, right? Because I'm no different than you. It's like, man, I, I see an outcome that I think is best, and I wanna work toward that outcome, and so I'm gonna bring some things. Let me tell you something, man. I'll tell you what, the other coach we had, man, things were great, man. I mean, we had like 30, 40 wins a season. It was actually 12, but you know what I'm saying? We do the same thing. We, we manipulate information in the same way. That's what complainers do. You know why? Because complainers are focused on themselves. Not unity, not outcome, not resolution. Complaining is a language of unbelief. We really don't believe that God has a plan and a purpose for whatever we're dealing with, and so we try to take matters into our own hands like Judge Wapner taught us to do, right? And... We complain and we argue and we grumble and we slander and we just, we're gonna try to get what we want. And it changes your perspective. I just want you to understand, it changes your perspective. Sometimes you think things that aren't true. You believe things that aren't true because you've, you've trained your mind to do that. All right, secondly, write this down. Let me give you a second danger. Not only does it change your perspective, it compromises your character. That's why Paul says in the original language, so it's literally, he says, live clean, here's the word, innocent lives, pure or blameless, okay, innocent. That word innocent means, write this down, unmixed, unmixed. Your life isn't mixed with sin, selfishness, it's pure, it's holy, it's blameless, it's unmixed for the Lord. Paul says, a life free from complaining, that's how you're working out what God has worked in, is a life prone to purity innocence being unmixed, and that's huge. Some of you are like, well, it's easy for Paul to say he was a missionary, he was a pastor, he was an apostle. Yeah, you know what else he was? Under house arrest, chained to a Roman centurion. 
he had every reason to complain. Don't you remember what he said in Philippians 1? Let me just remind you quickly. Remember he said this, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened to me here has helped me to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the entire palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. Paul's chained to a prisoner. We talked about this a few weeks ago, right? And his, his perspective is, this is the perspective of a non-complainer, a non-grumbler, right? Okay, a complainer would have been like, I cannot believe I'm in this situation. I've been beaten, shipwrecked, snake bitten, and now I'm chained to this guy for two years. I should be doing my own thing. I should be reaching Rome for Christ. That's what a complainer does. Paul is free from that. He doesn't have the language of unbelief. He believes in the Lord, in his providence, in his direction and guidance. And so Paul, even though it's not comfortable and it's hard and difficult, he's like, okay, I'm right where the Lord wants me to be. And so Paul's chained to a member of the Praetorian Guard, which is Caesar's own personal bodyguards. And his perspective is, who's the real prisoner here? It's not me. Dude's got to hear me share the gospel with them six hours a day. (laughs) That's the perspective and the freedom of a non-complainer. Because not only does complaining like change your perspective, you begin to believe things that aren't true. Let me tell you, um, it also will erode your character because, this is what Paul says, if you're free from it, you can live clean, innocent, unmixed lives Paul modeled that for us. The great A.W. Tozer, a Christian author, said it this way years ago. Among those sins most exquisitely fitted to injure the, the Christian's life and destroy the Christian's testimony, he said, few can equal the sin of complaining. It just, it's a soundtrack. It's addictive behavior. It, it's a negative disposition. And it erodes your character. It gives you a wrong perspective. You live with revisionist history all rooted in this very simple truth, you just don't trust the Lord. You just don't believe that in your mountaintop experiences and in your valleys, he's got you. And so you complain and you grumble and you argue and you divide. And Paul's like, man, you wanna live a life where you lean into God's good purpose for you, a marriage, family, all that. Man, here's, here's what it looks like to work out what God's worked in. Be free from complaining, arguing, divisiveness. Those are the warnings. Let me give you really quick the anecdote. Okay, write this down. The anecdote then to complaining is thanksgiving. Now, Paul doesn't touch on this Philippians 2, but we see evidence of this elsewhere. So I just want to mention it to you in a broader study of the New Testament. Listen, complaining focuses on what God isn't doing. Thanksgiving focuses on what he is. And and let me just give you a really helpful takeaway here. Nobody complains who sees God in the center of their situation. He's got you. Look at what Paul just said, Philippians 2. He's got a good purpose for you. And even if you feel like you're chained to something, God's got you. And if there's a concern, address it. And address it for the sake of unity. And address it for the sake of your own godliness. And address it for the sake of reconciliation or the betterment of whatever you're navigating, but don't complain, don't argue, don't bicker, don't fight, right? It's like, complaining is the language of unbelief. Thanksgiving is the language of faith. And um, Christ followers should be the least complaining people on planet Earth and the most grateful and thankful people on planet Earth because number one, this Earth is no longer our home. Number two, we have a God who's bigger than any of the circumstances that we face. And number three, he's empowered every single one of us to the extent that because God is for us, nothing can stand against us. And that thankfulness that we cultivate, this has to be intentional. Okay, let me tie all this together. You're gonna have to work at it because you're not gonna actually drift toward this. You're not gonna, listen, let me, let me use a double negative, English teachers. Okay, you ready for this? I'm gonna give you something to complain about on your way home today. All right, here we go. Okay, you're never, you're never not gonna drift toward Thanksgiving. You're always gonna drift toward complaining. You're always gonna drift toward something's wrong. I think the way I said that, actually, I double negative gave the positive. We'll go back and rewind it and change it. Okay, here we go. So, you don't naturally drift toward Thanksgiving. 
So if you wanna work out what God's working in and you wanna shine like a star where you work and where you live and in your family with your lost kids and your lost neighbors and listen, look at what Paul says. This isn't me, this is the Bible, this is God's word. You wanna work out what God has worked in and you wanna shine like a country star in a country night, then quit leaning into your negativity and quit letting it change your perspective and quit rewriting your life with revisionist history and quit undermining the power and the providence of God in your life and cultivate a spirit of thanksgiving. You ready to work at this? Let me give you a challenge for tomorrow. Today you've already complained about the rain, it's too late. Here we go. Tomorrow, you ready? You wanna know how hard this is? You ready for this? Tomorrow, here's our challenge, me included. I want you to go one day without complaining. Hey, how about just one day? How about tomorrow? How about just tomorrow? Some of you are like, I'm out. <laughs> like it ain't gonna, I'm with you. Listen, I'm with you. you. You ever think how hard, are you starting to see why Paul emphasizes this? How about go one day? All right, let's, okay, how about this? How about let's just collectively, right? Because we do have such a sweet fellowship and God's blessing in so many ways. So, uh, but, but, but this is just a helpful reminder, right? How about, the, how about let's just be intentional tomorrow. We're gonna work out tomorrow. Just put this in your mind. I'm gonna work out tomorrow what God has worked in. And so, yeah, there may be a moment I'm leaning into complaining and grumbling. Maybe that is the soundtrack of your life and right now God's working on you to change it. But here's what you need to do. It, you don't just put a sticky note on your vanity in the mirror that says, okay, don't complain. Here's what you, you gotta cultivate Thanksgiving. And you get up in the morning, and God, I may not understand X, Y, Z, and God, I have this concern and this burden, but God, I believe that you're able to do what's best. And even though I may not have this, I have these, and God, I wanna thank you. And just cultivate thanksgiving. That's what the psalmist does, Psalm 50. Whoever offers a thanksgiving sacrifice honors me, and whoever orders his conduct, I will show him the salvation of God. The Lord doesn't delight in offerings that are just routine. He delights in offerings that are accompanied with thanksgiving. And then, last thing, okay? In fact, let me ask you, stay with me. Come on, stay with me. And I wanna leave you with this. We're gonna pray, and we're gonna go not complain today, all right? <laughs> but can I just leave you with this today? Come on. Let me give you something you can take with you. Here's the truth. Thanksgiving, Bell Shoals, is the language of heaven. Thanksgiving's the language of heaven. This is where we're all headed, okay? So cultivate this in your life. I'm working on me too. It's Revelation 7, okay, then I'm gonna pray. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Thanksgiving is the language of heaven. There are no complainers in heaven. Some of you are like, I'm not sure I wanna go then. They're not there because we will then know fully, man, just the power, the love, the care of our God, right? Because complaining is the language of unbelief, thanksgiving is the language of faith, and throughout all eternity there will be wisdom and power and glory and honor and thanksgiving to our God, amen? Thanksgiving to our God. So let's thank him today, and then, uh, yeah, come on, we can celebrate that. All right. All right, and then we'll be dismissed. So Father, we do thank you that you are a good, loving, gracious, and merciful God. At your own expense, we saw this last week, you, you sent your son to die for our sin. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so Father, we owe our all to you. And we thank you that you have through the work of Jesus, proven your love for us so that when we're in circumstances and situations that are hurtful, when we are wrongly judged, when we face persecution, when our kids are hurt, when we don't see what's best taking shape in our situation, Father, we will trust in you because we know you love us. We know that you are for us and that you have a good purpose for us. So God, I pray that um, you'll help us today to cultivate a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving, to focus on who you are and what you've given us, and to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God, free us this week, I pray, from the negativity of our culture. God, help us um, to be positive, 
innocent, pure children of God who shine like stars in our dark world. For we ask it in Jesus' name.